Next to water, it's the world's number one drink. It's the primary delivery system for a very popular drug, and it was chewed before it was brewed. Its aroma is intoxicating, and its flavor easily makes us crave another cup. Today, we can't seem to do without this hot brown brew. Get ready to discover coffee on How Stuff Works. Believe it or not, the average coffee drinker in the United States downs an astonishing 1,168 cups a year. That's 73 gallons of the stuff. Whether you grab a road brew from a drive-thru... Have a wonderful day and thanks for coming by. ...or do your java on ice at a coffee shop. Every day, tens of millions of us participate in the ritual of drinking coffee. Clears your fuzziness in the morning. It's not just a wake up. This amazing beverage creates jobs, unites friends, keeps a modern workforce energized, and even has some health benefits. And that's with or without the caffeine. It's got complexity, it's got mystery, it's got history, and most importantly, it's a, got a tremendous amount of human element to it. Looks and taste can be deceiving when it comes to a cup of coffee. This is one profoundly complex beverage. And the same could be said about the beans that are the essence of its flavor. There are more than 200 different chemical compounds in a raw coffee bean. Roast it and the number skyrockets to more than 1,200 different substances. It ranges from non-soluble cellulose and, and ash and fiber up to volatile organic acids, aromatics, waxes, oils, all of which help uh, create the aroma and the fragrance, the taste, the mouthfeel, the sensation of coffee as you drink it. Coffee's flavor is born in the ripe red fruit or cherry of the coffee plant. The skin is bitter, but the flesh or pulp is sweet. Slimy mucilage covers the parchment husk that protects the prize inside. The two oblong seeds we call coffee beans. Three quarters of all cultivated coffee plants are Caffea Arabica, known for its flavor and mildness. The other main commercial species is the hardier Caffea canifora or Robusta, which is known to taste a bit more bitter. 70 different countries grow coffee in all tropical regions of the globe. Brazil is the largest exporter, followed by Vietnam, Colombia, Indonesia, and Mexico. Now we grow coffee in the U.S., in Hawaii and Puerto Rico, but nothing like the quantities we consume. The United States imports, roasts, and consumes more coffee than any other country in the world. And Folgers Coffee would know. They're the leading packaged coffee brand in the U.S., and their plant in New Orleans is one of the largest roasting and packaging facilities of any coffee company. The Folgers Roasting Plant brings in 250 to 300,000 tons of coffee through the Port of New Orleans each year. The plant is the port's largest customer. Gigantic white bulk bags the size of tractor trailer rigs are cut open, spilling thousands of pounds of green beans into grates that will funnel the coffee up into 12-story high storage silos. The scope of the operation is mind-boggling. We receive a bean, we roast the bean, uh, we grind the bean and then we'll package it um, in a variety of different formats. There are about 75 million cups of Folgers coffee consumed daily uh, in the U.S. and Canada. And while that sounds like a lot of Joe, globally it's just a drop in the bucket. Coffee consumption around the world is more like a tsunami. Two billion cups a day. These are the 6,000 foot green slopes of the Andes Mountains in Colombia. It's this geography and climate that contribute to making Colombian coffee exports total more than two billion pounds a year. But there is another secret ingredient to Colombia's world-renowned coffee, the cafetero. Nelson Mello is one of these dedicated coffee farmers and one of the first certified organic coffee growers in the country. This is a farm where we are working with an organic production system. We farm the variety of coffee called Catura. Everything we use on the farm, we make ourselves 
We buy nothing from outside sources. Para evitar estar comprando insumos de afuera. Organic coffee uses no synthetic chemicals, no synthetic pesticides or fertilizers. The approach Nelson uses is what can I add through natural processes to uh, contribute to the health of the trees and the quality of the crop. Instead of using chemical plant food, Nelson Mello grows nitrogen fixing trees near the coffee plants. These trees pull nitrogen out of the air. Then, with the help of microorganisms that live in their root system, the atmospheric nitrogen is converted into a free and natural fertilizer. And this tree, plus decaying weeds, become a cover, making the soil condition really good, even for animals. We can easily find worms. The earthworms allow the soil to get air. These animals are natural producers of organic matter or fertilizer. They eat the soil and their excrement is what we call warm humus. The tree's roots give the nitrogen and the worms give the humus. It's absolutely the best. It's very labor intensive, but hand picking is the only way to avoid unripe coffee. Coffee is going to taste best if it's picked when it's ripe and processed immediately. So good pickers have to be selective and pick coffee that's just at the right stage of ripeness in order to get coffee that's ultimately going to taste good. After the cherries are picked from the trees, they're taken to the Beneficio, where the traditional wet Colombian method of processing is done. The best cherries are put into the wet mill or depulper, where the fruit is separated from the bean. The discarded red pulp will be used as compost in the fields. The beans are soaked in water to break down the slimy mucilage that covers them. This fermentation process lasts from 12 to 24 hours and is critical to the value and flavor of the coffee. Nelson stops the fermentation by cleaning the beans with pure mountain water at just the right moment. His 86-year-old dad, Norberto, and his three-year-old son, Jesus, lend a hand. The washing process also sorts the beans by density. Defective beans are full of air and float, while the highest quality beans are heavy and sink in the washing channel. So these are the, the good ones. You can clearly see that it's um, with something below the parchment that is greenish or darker color. And these ones are really bright yellow because there's nothing inside. This washing is what gives Colombian coffee its distinctive taste and aroma. To enhance the quality of this organic coffee, any red pulp that made it through the process is removed by hand. It usually takes between 7 and 14 days to dry the beans. It all depends on the weather. It's difficult to have a good crop. Just because it is difficult does not mean it should not be done or that it is impossible. You are receiving the best. Enjoy this coffee made with love and good energy. That's the best message. And in North America, they're definitely drinking up the message by consuming 40% of the world's organically grown coffee. Altera Coffee is a small specialty roaster and retailer in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. They scour the world to find the finest beans. From Colombia alone, Altera Coffee Roasters will buy over 100,000 pounds of coffee this year to meet the demands of just our roasting for the year. Even though Milwaukee is a world away from the mountains of Colombia, this is where Nelson Mello's exceptional beans were discovered. We tasted Nelson's coffee blind on the cupping table, and we were blown away by it. A cupping table? Listen up. No one has lost their manners here. This is a cupping session. Cupping is coffee industry lingo for tasting. It's done at every step in the production of coffee, from checking arrival samples and quality control to making purchasing decisions or trying to discover a new exceptional coffee. 
Most cuppers carry their own custom silver slurping spoons. Some develop unique tasting techniques. But all adhere to the formal step-by-step -step process developed 100 years ago to systematically evaluate the coffee bean. The whole process, the ritual of cupping, is designed to give us an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, or a, a level playing field, we like to say. At the Specialty Coffee Association of America in Long Beach, California, some of the best palates in the country have assembled to appraise several coffees. Our interest is in promoting the consumption of uh, specialty coffee in the U.S. All of the beans are lightly roasted and ground the same way. First, the cuppers smell 10 grams of dry coffee to evaluate the characteristic referred to as fragrance. So we're looking for interesting and engaging aromas. We're going to be looking for fruits and berries, chocolate, caramel notes. Sometimes uh, butter notes are present in the fragrance that are a good indicator of quality in coffee. They will add six fluid ounces of water heated to between 195 and 205 degrees Fahrenheit. The ground coffee rises to the top, forming the crust. They let the coffee seep for four minutes before they break the crust, releasing a burst of aroma. At that moment in time, we get a tremendous amount of information about what that coffee is going to taste like. The foam is then removed or cleaned so it doesn't coat the palate and disrupt the next step. It's everything your mom told you not to do when you're eating soup. You very vigorously suck it into your mouth, and the slurping is getting an instant registration of all tastes on all taste buds simultaneously. They also evaluate the body or tactile sensation of how the coffee feels in the mouth. And they'll revisit the cups to assess the flavor changes as the coffee cools. One characteristic they hope to find might surprise you. We look for acidity in a cup of coffee because it imparts a sense of brightness, of liveliness to the cup. So we want acidity in coffee. It's a positive thing. So the next time you indulge, take the time to observe the taste and aroma, and perhaps practice your slurp. If there is one city in the U.S. synonymous with great coffee, it's Seattle, Washington. It can be argued that it all started in the Pikes Place Market District when a small coffee roaster opened for business in 1971. Of course, the rest is history. Have a grande caramel macchiato. Today, Starbucks is the world's largest coffee chain. They purchase 352 million pounds of green coffee beans per year to go into over 100 different blends and single origin coffees. The secret to the sensation is inside this 350,000 square foot building just south of Seattle. We're a coffee roaster. Many, many people don't understand that what we learned in the 1970s about roasting coffee is exactly the skill that we use today in order to roast 1.5 million pounds in this facility this week. The tour of Starbucks Inner Sanctum begins. Roasting and packaging coffee goes on here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I want to point out these large rolls that you see here. All of these will become coffee bags. And this is just one of five such plants around the world. The green coffee arrives in burlap or jute bags, weighing about 132 pounds each. We've collected them here, and you can see they're on pallets, and they're now waiting for the roasters to call for them. This machine is called the Cimbria, and it's the place where the coffee is going to say goodbye to its burlap bag. In just a moment, they can unload 13,000 to 15,000 pounds of coffee in an hour on this platform. The Cimbria is like a giant sifter. The shaking carefully removes any debris that might have been in the bag. The coffee is then stored in one of 20 green silos, holding as much as 20,000 pounds of raw beans. At the bottom of those silos, there is almost like a mixing bowl in your kitchen. 
And that mixing bowl is under the control of the person who's operating the roasting machine. We're bringing a little of this coffee and a little of this coffee and a little of this coffee to make the blends that you enjoy. That's our secret. Now comes the magic, the roast. This machine is like an oven at home, but combine your oven with your clothes dryer. And think about the way the clothes dryer turns with the baffles on the inside. And then think about sealing that up and making it 400 degrees. A chemical reaction takes place inside the roaster, altering the entire cellular structure of the bean. This is what causes all the flavor and aroma we know as coffee. We apply heat to the beans, and at first, all it's doing is it's driving out water. If you could look at the cell structure of these beans, you would see that inside the cells are round. As the moisture is driven out, it starts to turn like wood grain. Gases start to form inside the beans, and they actually pop like popcorn and expand almost twice their size. This state is called the first pop or crack. Most of the water has now evaporated. As the beans roast and turn darker, carbohydrates and fats turn into aromatic oils. Complex proteins and organic acids change into wonderful coffee flavors. Coffee has reached the point that we know it's going to be perfect. The front of the roaster will open up, the coffee will pour into the cooling tray, and the arm will begin to move that coffee around. For the next couple of minutes, the coffee's going to go from oven hot to room temperature. When you look at that big drum, imagine that it's a fan pulling air into it. Like a winemaker, the roaster style determines how the coffee is finished. A lighter roast brings out delicate floral and fruity notes from the bean. A darker roast creates deeper, sugary, and toasty flavors. The roaster must continuously monitor each load to ensure consistency. Of course, that number's perfect. Once approved, the coffee drops out of the bottom of the cooling tray and is vacuumed up by the distoner to remove any waste. Then, it's sent for mixing with other types of beans for the various blends. From here on, the roasted coffee will have very limited contact with air. Coffee is a product which is a fresh food product, and so it's going to go stale fairly quickly. Oxygen is the enemy. The different blends are sent in tubes to the packaging lines, where airtight bags of coffee are filled and sealed. However, packaging freshly roasted coffee beans presents a unique problem. It's going to begin to degas. The coffee is going to give off carbon dioxide, and that has to go somewhere. To allow the roasted beans to degas without exposing them to oxygen, a one-way valve is stamped into the package. When that coffee begins to degas, the gas will go this way without allowing oxygen to go this way. This allows us to put coffee in a bag and maintain freshness. When you open the bag in your home, what you're going to smell is the smell of fresh roasted coffee, exactly the same as I'm smelling here today in the Kent Roasting Plant. It goes without saying, the coffee roasting process is truly where science and art convene. How much do Americans love coffee? According to the National Coffee Association, an incredible 400 million cups are consumed every day in the USA. So with 54% of the population gulping down so much coffee, you've got to ask, is this stuff any good for you? It can be an important part of a healthy lifestyle. Recent studies are showing that coffee consumption in moderation can actually have a number of health benefits because coffee contains antioxidants. Well, an antioxidant is simply a naturally occurring chemical that fights the damaging effects of oxygen in the body. And the compounds in uh, coffee are called polyphenols. These are found in many fruits and fruit juices, and they're also found in coffee because, of course, coffee comes from the coffee bean, uh, which is then roasted and releases many of these compounds. But the ingredient most coffee drinkers are interested in is the legal classified stimulant drug, caffeine. This typical cup of coffee would have about the amount of caffeine that would fill up about one quarter of this teaspoon. In numbers, that's around 150 milligrams. Your average stay awake pill would have 100. Caffeine in your coffee changes your brain's chemistry. 
It blocks the action of the chemical adenosine that's associated with sleep. That's why after a coffee, you feel more awake. Caffeine activates the brain's pleasure center, which contributes to caffeine addiction. And it also triggers the sympathetic nervous system, setting off the fight or flight response. This stimulation injects adrenaline into your system, making you more alert and responsive. And that's what causes the coffee buzz. That makes your pulse race, makes your palms sweaty, makes your heart beat more quickly. But the buzz is not so great if you have heart trouble. If in fact your heart has areas of blood flow that are not well uh, supplied, it may be that your heart will get into a stress situation where you can actually precipitate a heart attack. However, most studies don't document a negative effect of caffeine, so it's very much an individual matter for a person who may be susceptible to these effects. But remember, these effects are based on moderate consumption of caffeine. That's less than 300 milligrams or three cups of coffee a day. And get this, instant coffee usually contains less than drip or brewed coffee. And this is a shocker. Espresso contains the least, but only if you stay with a single shot. Coffee houses make up the fastest growing part of the restaurant business in the US, checking in with a 7% annual growth rate. And why not? It's the daily intersection of culture and caffeine. People are getting sort of continuously more isolated, and I think the coffee house here is a great place. You can see your friends every day, um, sort of as a community gathering spot. It's actually been that way for centuries. Coffee was originally consumed in Ethiopia as fruit. Then it was dried and brewed with hot water during the 9th century. The appeal of coffee spread first throughout the Middle East, and eventually the rest of the world followed. By the end of the 1600s, coffee houses were all the rage across Europe. Lloyd's of London started out as a coffee house, and it was frequented by people who had an interest in shipping, and ultimately it grew up to become the largest shipping insurer in the world. Typically, those folks were referred to as the intelligentsia, um, not because they wanted to be self-congratulatory, but because they were philosophers, poets, mathematicians, uh, politicians, talking about what was going on. Doug Zell's modern intelligentsia coffee houses in Los Angeles and Chicago pay homage to that hangout heritage. But today, he and other specialty coffee entrepreneurs have a different mission. The mission is, you know, to, to get, really to, to have the best coffee in the world, uh, and I think to, to showcase how great coffee can be. Washington Post journalist and food writer Michael Weissman had a coffee epiphany at Murky Coffee in Arlington, Virginia. I took the first sip and something happened in my mouth and I went, oh, this is different. What Michael experienced is what some have called the third wave of coffee's evolution where the drink is elevated to the same pinnacle of respect and adoration, usually conferred on fine wines or gourmet cuisine. The taste rolls around caramel, different chocolates. I've heard people say rye bread. I've heard them say meaty. The discriminations at the top level are really quite astounding and sometimes comic. Bubblegum, juicy fruit. Coffee's first wave was the great industrialization of its marketing, packaging, and distribution that made it an accessible and affordable drink. The next progression was when Americans began to drink espresso and think more about flavor. Then Starbucks exploded on the scene, introducing millions to higher coffee standards. There's sort of a group of young entrepreneurs who think of themselves as taking coffee to higher levels, more handmade, more artisan, more boutique, more gourmet than ever before. The third wave. When somebody presents you with a great glass of wine, you know, or a great tap of, of microbrewery beer or a single malt scotch, it's a, a product to be revered. And I think, you know, that's where we should be taking coffee. About one out of every five cups of coffee consumed in the United States is a decaf. And the popularity of coffee without the jolt is increasing. Decaffeinated coffee accounts for 
17% of all coffee sales in the U.S. Coffee must have at least 97% of its caffeine removed to qualify as decaffeinated. But getting the caffeine out of the bean is no easy matter. Outside of Vancouver, British Columbia is the Swiss Water Decaffeinated Coffee Company. Here, green coffee beans literally pour in from roasters and retailers all over the world who want their coffee decaffeinated. Caffeine is one of the hundreds of naturally occurring chemical compounds found in a coffee plant. The trick to making decaf is to soak the caffeine out of the bean, but leave the other chemicals in that give coffee its flavor. We can easily do in excess of 20 million pounds of coffee a year out of this facility. That's right, he said 20 million pounds. The Swiss water process uses a system where water, pressure, and time removes the caffeine from the beans. Here's how it works. The beans first enter a vibrating cleaning machine to eliminate debris. Then they begin a five-story ride through a maze of pneumatic blue tubes. Traveling at over 100 feet per second, they're transferred to the giant silver extractors. This is where the caffeine will be soaked out of the beans. Each extractor tank can hold a ton of green coffee beans. As you can see on the top of the extractors, we have a lot of valves that are automatically controlled in order to ensure that we remove the exact amount of caffeine that we're required to take out and to preserve the flavor of the coffee. Inside the extractors, the beans are seeped in a special extract made out of hot water and flavor compounds derived from other green coffee beans. Since there is no caffeine in the extract, the caffeine in the beans readily dissolves out. And it's this concentration difference called driving force, which is driving the caffeine out of the beans into the extract. Caffeine continues to come out of the beans as long as there is less caffeine in the extract than in the beans. To ensure this difference, the extract is constantly filtered through activated carbon filters to remove the caffeine. When the coffee is 99.9% .9 caffeine free, the wet beans are then conveyed to the dryer. The decaffeinated beans are then bagged up and sent to roasters around the world. It's a long and complicated process to purge the buzz from the bean. And there are plenty of die-hard caffeinated drinkers out there that swear decaf tastes different. But one expert begs to differ. If you have a good decaffeinated coffee that is processed correctly and brewed correctly, you will not be able to taste the difference. I guarantee it. The saying goes, anyone can learn to cook, but not everyone can become a chef. It's this kind of attitude that is sweeping coffee houses all over America. You don't just make coffee anymore. You aspire to become a barista. Most people call a barista as anybody standing behind the counter in within striking distance of an espresso machine. A barista for us is a coffee and espresso preparation expert. Today, preparing coffee is almost a calling, and making a perfect espresso drink is the highest form of the divine service. Technically, espresso is a coffee beverage that is prepared by forcing pressurized water through finely ground coffee. This method concentrates the coffee flavor. Espresso production is a very, very sensitive way to make coffee, and to get a great espresso, you need a very highly skilled operator. It's a lot like theater in a lot of ways, but I think people are really interested, and a lot of people see everything we're doing, and wonder why it's taking longer than it does at other shops, because this does take a little bit of time. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Specialty Coffee Association of America's 2008 United States Barista Championship. Each year, baristas from 10 different regional events vie for the U.S. title and are rock star-like celebrity status in the coffee world. The barista functions in this competitive environment just as they would in a great coffee house, so they interact with the judges as though they were customers. The flavors from the cappuccino are incredible. There are also technical judges watching every move made during this coffee combat. Grinding, dosing, tamping, brewing, steaming, and serving. Here you have the greatest baristas in the nation. After three attempts, 
Kyle Glanville from Los Angeles capture the coveted trophy. Round of applause for Mr. Kyle Glanville. When they actually announced my name, I was just like speechless. And I, I never would have thought it would have knocked the wind out of me like it really did, but I was absolutely overwhelmed. Kyle has been a barista for eight years, and he is so good at it. Intelligentsia Coffee made him their head of espresso research and development. And here's the pro in action. Here's my loosely ground uh, distributed coffee. I'm actually gonna have to distribute this coffee more evenly using my index finger. I do a sweep so that now I have a nice even puff of coffee. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm actually gonna compact the coffee using a hand tamper. So to do that, as it makes contact with the coffee, nice light tamp to start. Gently tap the outside of the basket so any coffee grounds around the edge fall back on top. And then one more, a little bit more pressure, release, and just give it a little polish. Insert the porta filter and immediately brew. Kyle says any good barista will constantly be chasing the perfect grind and extraction that will produce the flawless shot. So this one is uh, over extracted. You notice it has this sort of burned looking edges. It's also a very short portion of liquid. This one is under extracted. The portion of liquid itself would be an immediate indicator that this was under extracted. Just lacking sort of a nice tongue coating uh, experience. And then this is actually properly extracted. It's crema all the way to the edges. Crema, by the way, is coffee lingo for foam. So the next time you order up an espresso, check out your crema and see if it's reaching the edges of your cup. That's yeah, good. This is the famed Cauca region in southwestern Colombia. Clouds hang over the Andes Mountains and bring the generous rain needed to grow the famed coffee of the region. But this year, there has been too much for too long. Coffee farmer Olivia Saria is worried. The harvest from her 10-acre finca outside the tiny town of Tambo has been unusually small due to excessive rains. Olivia's husband, Geraldo, is wet milling what little coffee fruit they have collected. The red pulp falls on one side, and the precious coffee beans drop into the other. Just take a look at some of this. A different feeling. It's just... Timothy Castle is a coffee importer who sells beans to coffee roasters. As a specialty coffee importer, I see my role as that of a matchmaker, finding great farmers and great roasters to pair together. Colombian coffee exporter Alejandro Cardenia works with the growers to help them produce exactly what the roasters want. It's my responsibility to tell her what she's doing wrong. It's in her best interest, it's in my best interest, and it's in everybody's interest that everybody does their job the best they can. About 30 minutes away is a five-acre coffee farm owned by Alba Jolima Potosi, another committed cafetero. Unfortunately, there too, the harvest news is not good. Alba tells Tim and Alejandro it's very late in the season and she is still trying to pick her coffee. You see that this one has a lot of cherries, but the one beside it doesn't have any. And when it rains in the Andes, it pours, compounding the crisis. Alba usually dries her beans outside under plastic tarps. Now, the abnormal moisture has forced her to bring the coffee into the house. She can't sell the beans until they are dry. The living room is her last hope. For Alba and Maria, growing coffee accounts for 80% of their annual gross income, or about 2,000 US dollars a year. They must get their beans to market. It's morning in the historic colonial town of Papillon. In the warehouse district, the coffee is already pouring into Veermax's purchasing center. This is where the region's coffee beans are selected for export around the world. These growers believe they have something special, exceptionally high quality beans, that if accepted, can bring more than three times the price of average coffee. 
it's all about the craftsmanship and the attention to detail that the coffee farmer does to his coffee, which makes the makes or breaks it. Understandably, the growers are nervous as they watch their coffee go through the qualifying tests. These bags of coffee represent an entire year's work and income. A sample is taken with a long pole called a trier, which removes just enough for analysis of the crop. The sample is then weighed and taken to the moisture meter. If the coffee is too wet, it will spoil. So to pass this test, the meter must show only between 10 and 12 percent humidity. Maria's crop is in trouble. Her beans were disqualified as too wet, so she has spread her coffee out in the sun in a last-ditch effort to dry the beans out some more. Meanwhile, inside, sample beans are put into a mini mill to remove the protective husk or parchment. A sifter then sorts the sample to remove small and broken beans. More flawed beans are eliminated by hand. After it passes the physical checks that we have, then we would roast it and cup it. And then that's the crucial step. And what we're interested in is that the cup tastes good. As the cupping or tasting session is prepared, there is good news. Maria's beans have dried enough to qualify. Inside, the tasting has started. The emphasis of cupping used to be on detecting defects, and now we're, we're looking for the nuances and the high notes. Uh, we're looking for the best instead of the worst in what a coffee has to offer. The coffee needs to score on a 100-point scale more than 80 so that we buy it. This one for me was 86 to 87. This was an exceptional market day in Papillon. All of the coffees submitted made the grade, ensuring a win for everyone involved. Hidden high in the green mountains of Panama is a jewel of a coffee plantation called Hacienda Esmeralda. Esmeralda means emerald in Spanish, but in the world of coffee, it now means mucho money. This is the home of Gourmet Coffee's Holy Grail. Produced exclusively from geisha beans, Hacienda Esmeralda Especial earned the highest price ever paid in a coffee auction. $150 a pound green, $300 a pound roasted, you know, $25 a cup. Why so valuable? Because no one has ever tasted anything like it. Native to Ethiopia, it was completely forgotten until it was rediscovered, mysteriously growing at Hacienda Esmeralda in Panama. As a varietal, it is that different. Frankly, the first time I thought cupcation, I thought I was drinking some sort of a very fruity tea. Very distinct. And you have to wonder, how did this variety get that different from the others? I don't know. Esmeralda's Geisha is also renowned for the excitement it has brought to the coffee business. This experience that's so unique, so rare, so valuable, that it's worth that money. But if you want to talk about unique, there is one type of coffee that trumps all others, politely called animal coffee. This is um, coffee that's based on the concept of the animal digesting it for, for you instead of processing it as it normally would be. And it's, uh, it's an intriguing concept, um, a little disgusting. We're not making this up. In Indonesia, the luwak or palm civet, a cat-like animal, uses its keen eyesight and sense of smell to select and consume the best coffee cherries. Enzymes in the animal's stomach acid are said to leach out proteins responsible for bitterness. When the luwak expels the coffee beans, the excrement is collected, the dung washed away, and the beans are roasted. We got together all the poop coffees, if you will, that we could find. We even found some bird poop coffee, some civet poop coffee, and uh, I guess there's some weasel uh, digested coffee too. And we could not discern these coffees from uh, the lowest quality, lowest price coffees on the market. We really couldn't. Tim's taste test translated, poop coffee tastes like, well, poopy coffee. Try some yourself. 
A half pound of natural Kopi Luwak will set you back $60, but you do get this attractive keychain with some natural, unprocessed beans sealed in Lucite. Sales on all kinds of homebrew coffee machines are taking off as more and more Americans are brewing their own coffee in a mind-bending selection of different contraptions. Salud! Most people in their lives will never be able to drive a Rolls Royce or have a thousand dollar bottle of wine, but they can have, almost every day of their life, the equivalent experience in terms of a great coffee. That's good coffee. So, what should you keep in mind to get the best out of your coffee? You should be buying coffee when it's the freshest from landing here, not unlike buying, you know, great peaches in the summertime. Look for a roasting date on the package and buy it as freshly roasted as you can. Remember, roasted coffee has the life expectancy of a fresh loaf of bread and store it in an airtight container. What we recommend is the bag that it comes in is a wonderful container. But remember that when you open it, within seven days, it's going to be stale. So a cool, dry place, like your cabinet, in the bag that you purchased it in, is a perfect way to store the coffee. Then there is the execution. Brew it wrong, and your carefully handled fresh coffee can quickly be put to death. Brewed coffee is made up of hundreds of different chemical compounds, so you should drink it right away. And within a few minutes, those compounds start reacting and changing the, the, the way that cup of coffee will taste. One of the main mistakes in making coffee is not using enough. You want to use about a, a two tablespoon scoop of whole bean coffee for every six ounces of water. The best way to brew, the connoisseurs prefer manual pour over methods. The water and the coffee are suspended in the same solution, so four minutes to brew your coffee. So the next time you have coffee, no matter how you take it or where, pause for just a second to consider the long journey those beans have taken. Coffee is more than just a commodity in a cup. There's many hands, many faces. There's a million people waving back at them saying, I hope you enjoy the cup of coffee. Now you know how coffee works and you'll probably never taste this stuff the same way again.